So hello and welcome. Today's topic will be anomaly detection in distribution shift setups. My name is Matthias Ragoy and together with my colleague Stefan Smeo at the Defender Theoretical Research Team, we will present two of our recent papers on the field of anomaly detection. I will first present AnoShift, a distribution shift. Is it okay on Zoom? Okay. First, I will talk about AnoShift, a distribution shift setup for anomaly detection in network traffic data. And then Stefan will talk about environment aware anomaly detection methods for images. Yes, so first, AnoShift, but before that, what is distribution shift? Does anyone know? So it refers to data with a non-stationary distribution in time. And anomaly detection, it refers to identifying outliers in data. As related work, there is PyOD, which is the most comprehensive and scalable Python library for anomaly detection. It contains many algorithms and models and many benchmarks, but it lacks a focus on data with distribution shift. And that is what AnoShift or proposed benchmark is addressing. So first we provide the detailed analysis of the distribution shifts from several perspectives. We evaluate the changes occurring in data using a Kisner representation and a feature level analysis. And we also estimate the magnitude of the data non-stationarity with an optimal transport data set distance. Then we introduce AnoShift, an unsupervised anomaly detection benchmark that aims to better evaluate the model's performance in this setup where data has a non-stationary distribution. And we also show how acknowledging and addressing the distribution shift may positively impact the model's performance. Uh, we built the AnoShift benchmark on Kyoto 2006 plus dataset, which is a network intrusion detection dataset spanning 10 years. And it has a natural distribution shift due to this extensive time span that it covers. And we split the test data based on temporal distance in the IID for independent and identically distributed near and far splits. And we showed that a large variety of baselines fail to adapt to the far data when it's trained on temporal distance data. And I would also mention that the anomalies in the Kyoto 2006 plus data set uh, comes from honeypots, so unwanted traffic in the system. Oh, you can stop me at any time if you have any questions, and we can also take some questions at the end of the two presentations. Okay, so we pre-process the data by uh, binning some of the numerical features using an exponentially increasing bin size. And you can see that in the log sequence sample in the image where we have the columns one, three, and four. So duration, source bytes, and destination bytes, where we replace some of the numerical features with bin indices. And this pre-processing results in a fixed vocabulary size, and therefore we can apply language modeling over the data. The motivation for the AnoShift benchmark resulted from a detailed analysis of the Kyoto 2006 dataset. And we first generated a Disney visualization. Here on each row, we show the data representation of one year new subset when we overlapped it with all the other subsets. And what we notice is that the data subsets are more separated with temporal distance. So again, the way to look at this plot is that on the i row, we have the data representation of data subset i, which is a constant, and it's overlapped with all of the others. Second, we measure the feature level uh, distribution shift by computing the geophrase divergence between So 
Here we have on each row and each column, the same data subset. One data subset is one year of data. So from 2006 to 2015. And the column A and row J uh, shows the overlap of the data representation of the height and J data subsets in two dimensions. Yes, and the takeaway here is that the subsets are more separated when the distance in time increases. So for example, if you follow one row, the subsets are somewhat more compact at first and then they tend to become more separated in time. Okay. So for the feature level analysis, we computed the distance between uh, feature histograms between each pair of data subsets. Uh, Jeffrey's divergence is simply a symmetrized version of the pullback library divergence. So it is a distance metric between probability distributions. And here again, we notice that the feature histograms become more dissimilar as the subsets are more distant in time. And here we show the distances between the histograms for three features, which are service on the left, source bytes on the middle, and destination bytes on the right. And we also compute the optimal transport data set distance between each pair of data subsets. And we compute this between the inliers, the plot on the left, between the outliers, the plot on the right, and between the inliers and outliers, the plot on the middle. And we also notice that for the inliers, the distances increases with temporal distance. But for the outliers, the opposite happens, such that the distance between inliers and outliers decreases in time. Okay, we next evaluate multiple baselines on the Anoshift benchmark by computing the I, uh, ROC value on the three data splits. And we have both classical and deep learning baselines. Some of these are probabilistic methods, such as ECODE and COPOD, proximity-based methods, such as local outlier factor, deep SPDD, which does one class deep classification, LUNAR, which is a graph-based method, BERT for anomalies, which is a mass language model, and some other baselines. And what we notice is that for all, most of the models, we have a better performance on the IID split compared to NIA and that on all of the models, we have a very low performance on the power split. So the best performing baseline on the power split, which is COPOD, barely has a random performance on this temporarily distant data. So this shows that uh, all of the models fail to generalize on the power split. Uh, when we look at the precision recall AUC value for the outliers, we notice that most of the most of the values are generally high, even on the far data. So they range from seventy five percent to ninety something percent. But when we look at precision recall AUC value for the inliers, we notice a very consistent performance degradation in time. So we have this consistent trend of performance on IID, which is higher than the performance on near which is higher than the performance on far. So this hints towards a very low recognition for temporarily distant inliers that we notice for th those baselines. We also show these results in a plot format. On the middle, we show how the, the almost linear trend for the performance decrease for the inlier class. On the right, we see that the precision recall AUC for the outliers is somewhat more consistent in time. And on the left, we show the ROC value, which is basically a combination of the two with different weightings. Apart from common anomaly detection models, we also use a bird for anomalies, which is trained in mask language modeling mode. And at inference time, we uh, randomly masked tokens in the sequence, and we use the unmasked tokens as a context. And we compute the anomaly score based on the probability of the original tokens given by the model. We also evaluate this model on, sorry, we also evaluate this model on the data at the final granularity, so at the month level. 
And what we notice is that precision recall AUC is slowly decreasing during the ID and near splits, and it drops suddenly just before the power split. And at the same time, we notice a very poor modeling of the offlayer class, which has a much more chaotic evolution in time. Uh, do you have any questions so far? Okay, so we slightly tackle the distribution shift by. Oh, yes, yeah, so an entry looks something like something like this. So it is a sequence of basically tokens. Uh, some of the columns are strings such as service, uh, other columns were being fire preprocessing and are now being identifiers and some numerical features that are basically percent percentage values. So each entry has a fixed length of in 40, 40 tokens, and we randomly mask 15% of this. Yes? Why is the on the port the name? Label means uh, whether the, the this uh, log instance is an attack or not in this data set. Yeah, this is unsupervised learning. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good observation. And we also slightly approach the distribution shift. Oh, sorry, we have a message in Zoom. Yeah, I just noticed this. Sorry. Uh, can you say intuitively what changes? Or what kind of changes happen in time? Yes, so the question was, can you say intuitively what kind of changes happen in time? What are the most likely causes of the degradation in performance? So uh, here's some of the histograms and their change for some of the features. And we notice, for example, in the service, the, the distribution of this particular feature drastically changes in time. So we have more, for example, DNS entries on the later stages of the data collection as opposed to, uh, to the train data and to the near data. So it's yeah, mostly changes in the distribution or the frequency of occurrence of some of the tokens in the sequence. Do we have other questions? On Zoom or in the audience. Then we move to addressing the distribution shift. So for this setup, we compare several training regimes, ID, fine tune, and distillation. We train on data from 2006 up to 2010, and we evaluate on data from 2011 to 2015. And here we define a data collection as a set of data containing uh, the subset of 2006 and successively adding each uh, data subset up until 2010. So in the ID mode, we simply concatenate the data subsets in a collection, and we randomly draw samples from it. And also instantiate a new model at each data collection and we compute the cross entropy loss between the model's prediction at the randomly masked tokens and uh, the original tokens. For the finder mode, we iterate through the subsets of the data collection and we train the same model using the same cross entropy loss between the predictions and the original tokens. And in distillation, we also iterate through the subsets of the data collection. And uh, at each subset, the current model becomes a teacher to a newly instantiated student model, which we train by combining the mask language modeling loss with the callback libeler divergence between the student and teacher predictions on the given subset. 
And here we show the evaluation results aggregate, uh, aggregated over all data collections at each of the test subsets. And we report the fine tune and distillation relative to the IID strategy. And what we notice is that distillation performs the best with an improvement of 3% in average in ROC, which goes up to 10% on some of the subsets. And it also obtains a much better precision recall AUC values for the inlier class. So this shows that even by uh, taking into account the timestamps present in data, we can improve the model's performance. So by using the temporal information in the data set. And we next evaluate the robustness to data corruption. And here we approach the more realistic setup of having data without labels. So we can't uh, train the model using only clean data. Therefore, we contaminate the train data with anomalies between 0 and 25%. And, uh, we have another question in Zoom. Do all strategies use the same new data? the same new data in the new year. Yes, they all use the same data. But yeah, it only differs the ordering of the data. So only ID randomly draws samples from the data without taking into account the temporality of the data. Thank you for the question. So uh, back to the robustness to data corruption, we evaluate the BERT model at each corruption level. And what we notice is a very consistent trend between data corruption level and performance degradation. And this leads to the obvious conclusion that if the data is cleaner, then the models will better learn to detect the outliers. And we next move to the supervised learning setup where we we do use the labels present in data to perform binary classification using the same baselines that we use in the unsupervised learning case. And uh, here the classes are normal traffic, so the inliers and attacks as the outliers. We also evaluate the ROC score, precision recall AUC for the inliers and the precision recall AUC for the outliers. And we notice a very similar trend with the unsupervised learning case where we have a slight performance drop on year compared to ID and a very drastic performance drop on the far split. So to evaluate the gap between the supervised and unsupervised learning setups, we compute the difference between the best performing supervised baseline and the BERT model for the unsupervised case. And we notice that obviously the supervised baselines have an advantage by using the information in the data labels. But we also noticed that uh, the highest uh, difference is obtained on the far data. So this leads to the conclusion that the unsupervised learning case is even more prone to fail on temporal distant data, given the setup. And we also investigate some of the limitations of pre-processing. We compare several baselines on the data with and without the proposed feature binning that I mentioned earlier. And we noticed that indeed feature binning does impact the model performance in a negative way, but not to a significant degree. And we also noticed that the data set is not yet solved even without processing, but nonetheless, binning is one of the limitations of this benchmark. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we also consider some other some other data sets for the given benchmark, and I will now give a short overview of them and some of their limitations that prevented us from uh, including them in the Anoshift benchmark. 
and this is to further highlight the importance of the new newly proposed benchmark. So we first look at some network traffic data sets and we notice that most of them have a relatively short time span, so in the matter of days of some years. And some of these were also artificially designed, meaning that the anomalies were manually were more like simulated at predefined timestamps. And some of these were already solved. So the best reporting methods already have a very high performance on these data sets. Then we looked at some system logs data sets, and we also noticed the same short time span in the artificial design. And here we used two of the most popular uh, system logs parsers, which are drain and spell. And moreover, we noticed that for some of the data sets, we have a really high difference between the two uh, between the two preprocessors that we used, which means that there is a lot of sensitivity to choosing this initial preprocessing. And we also looked at some multivariate time series data sets. And again, some of these were really short and others were almost completely solved. And as future work, we have two main direct directions. The first one would be to extend the benchmark to other formats, such as graph structures, by using the IP information present in data, the source and destination IP, and also to some microservice infrastructures, and also to other domains, such as system blocks and multivariate time series, but also computer vision. And Stefan will give a short overview of the applications of anomaly detection in image data. And the second main future work direction would be to improve the anomaly detection either by addressing the limitations given by preprocessing, which refers to both log parsing and tokenizers and binning, and also designing of anomaly detection models specifically for this case of distribution shift data. So that would be it with the first presentation. Thank you for listening. And I suggest that Stefan gives his presentation now and we can take some questions for both of them at the end. Would that be okay? Okay, thank you. And another uh, paper accepted at uh, NeoRips. Uh, this time at the distribution shift workshop, done uh, the research team. Uh, yeah. It's uh, based on um, anomaly detection on distribution, on distributional shift data. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, defining what we understand by anomaly detection and distribution shift. Um, so, anomaly detection is basically an umbrella term for methods whose goal is to identify samples that deviate from some kind of uh, assumed notion of normality, uh, where normal set abnormal data uh, do fit in different distributions. So, from the graph uh, on the side, we can say that uh, M1 and M2 are two different distributions, one denoted uh, as normal data and the other as abnormal. And we, have, we, want, we want to differentiate between those. Um, just with, with distribution shift, uh, also called the main shift, uh, we understand uh, that it's a paradigm in which we aim to learn a model on source uh, data distribution to perform um, on another different but somewhat related target data. So with the same analogy of the same graph, let's say we train uh, our model on M1 distribution, we want the same model to perform good on the other distribution like N2 or O3. Um, and we are interested in uh, anomaly detection on distributional shift data, as I said uh, on the first slide. So what does that mean? Um, we practically learn uh, our model on N1. We want to identify the anomalies that are, uh, let's say, O3, but we still want to detect uh, normal data that uh, or anomalies uh, from uh, that are different in some way from our uh, train. So that would be N2. Uh, so what are the similarities between those methods? Because we saw that both are based on uh, identifying some distribution and take action upon them. 
Uh, so that's the similarity between those two. Uh, and uh, what are the differences? Because they seem quite kind of alike. Well, the differences that are, are in what changes are relevant with respect to our tasks. So in a number of detection, we want to detect the changes uh, relevant to our task. So that will be to detect anomalies, uh, normal data uh, versus anomalies. So we call this changes that appear in the data that tell us uh, that we can divide between those two as content changes. Moreover, in the main shift scenario, we take action on changes that un are unrelated to our task at hand. Uh, the difference, uh, differences between the mains in which that allies but should not affect task at hand. Uh, we call this style changes. And uh, to better depict uh, uh, the differences between those two, uh, this is a diagram of uh, data set of uh, Images with animals in them. Uh, I was data, data set. <clears throat> uh, and the task we, are, we want to do on those images is to identify uh, animals between them. Uh, but we can see that uh, our environment, or in this case, uh, specifically the background, changes uh, between samples. Uh, so for a model to, defer, to understand what is an animal and what, uh, so what is an animal or relevant data and what is a background or somewhat unrelevant uh, is kind of tricky. Um, so that is time change, which happens between those environments. Uh, and uh, the content uh, is the change between the classes of animals. So that's uh, anonymously correlated with our test. So to recap, <clears throat> style changes comes from the natural variety in the data. So we have pictures from different environments, but with the same animals in them. Uh, are, are, are unrelated to the task and should be ignored. Uh, and content changes, which actually determines the task. So they are then within these pictures. Uh, so it's anonymously part anonymously with the labels in the supervised scenario, let's say. Um, so how the changes, those these two changes interact with one another. So to better explain this, I'm, I prepared an example on the water birds data set. For those who do not know, that's a data set of land birds and water birds, uh, which are presented in different environments, uh, land and water. And for the sake of simplicity, we say that uh, at training time, we do have land birds occurring just on land and water birds with occurring just on water. Uh, so if we train a good model that can uh, differentiate between those two with a high confidence score, uh, we will see that uh, it, it learns various features or correlation between uh, labels and the background or the environment. So let's say if we construct um, the third image uh, in the diagram, uh, where we depict a boat in the same uh, background as the second image, uh, because we, we learn uh, in a classical way of just uh, uh, separating between those two uh, words, uh, our model will have to say that uh, it's going to be either of the two classes, but because it is a lot of water, it assumes that it has to be a water bird, which is false uh, because that's just a boat. Um, and in our scenario, that would be an anomaly. So we want to detect that as an anomaly, not as a water bird. What we could assume that's a natural anomaly is a fourth picture where there's a cat with a somewhat abstract background. Uh, so the, the content of the picture, the thing that we, we are interested in, the cat, let's say, uh, is different from the birds. So we are in an, another distribution of data, as well as the background. It's neither land or water. And with this picture, the models fails to identify um, either of those bird classes. So that's what we call like a natural anomaly. 
So to resume the classical machine learning approach, the model might learn spurious features or correlation between labels and backgrounds uh, that wrongly labels the sample from the domain information in class. In our example, it associated water with water bird and land with land bird. Um, so luckily there are methods to mitigate this, which we call environment aware methods. And uh, they were kind of similar to this. This, this is this uh, is an environment supervised environment aware method that tries to mitigate uh, the previous dimension effect. Um, so what Lisa does is, uh, or I shall say, start with our example. So we, we build a colored MNIST data set in which uh, we took just the digits Q and five and matched them with colors, uh, green and red. But we, we <coughs> uh, changed the frequency in which they appear in the data set. So the Q, the green of Q, uh, let's say that way, appears in 40% of the train data, while uh, the red of Q appears only in 10%. And that goes uh, the same with five, but the uh, inverse. So we might associate uh, green with the left with the digit two and red with the digit five we, if we are not careful. So how will Lisa uh, mitigate this? Uh, it uses a mix up based approach by performing linear interpolation between two samples, uh, picking randomly from two strategies, which I listed below. The first one is infra label, which uh, interpolates samples with same label but different domains. Uh, well, we can see on the first row on the right, if we have the two digits of five with different colors and interpolate them, we get a sample that has both domains information in the same label of uh, in a sample. So what we get is a sample with both information. So we cannot correlate a domain or an environment strictly with one label. Uh, that's kind of the intuition behind the matching uh, sample. And the other strategy is interdomain, which interpolates samples to the same domain but different labels, just depicted in the second row. The intuition is the same that we're gonna have a sample with two labels and just one domain. So we cannot really correlate either uh, one domain with one label at a time. Uh, for uh, explain better why this works, uh, uh, it does. Uh, do interpolation on one code labels as well. So we can actually do supervision on the second uh, instance of uh, interpolation. So uh, what we actually do over this stuff that I mentioned is building a benchmark for unsupervised anomaly detection in images, um, where we set up the differences between anomaly detection and classical supervised distribution shift analysis. Uh, we empirically proved that the environment where, uh, where learning methods produce better embeddings for anomaly detection. Um, and at last, uh, we adjust uh, contrastive learning to be aware of multiple environments, which in turn improves performance uh, over uh, different distribution, uh, different style uh, uh, imagery. So what we kind of uh, listed here are the four scenarios in which we do have style and content changes. Um, we say by ID, uh, meaning in distribution, uh, meaning that that's a single group of data in which uh, we test and train on. Uh, so on the first row actually is the classical machine learning approach where we assume that training and testing data came, comes from the same distribution. So everything works wonderful. Um, on the second row, we do have the classical auto distribution uh, approach where we do have different styles uh, coming uh, in test uh, with respect to the training data but the content does not change. So what does that mean? Uh, is that uh, we do have the same classes that we want to do supervision, but the style in the testing data changes slightly or more. Um, and uh, some kind of methods that do mitigate uh, this are LISA, which we discussed on the previous slide. Um, 
The third one is the classical anomaly detection paradigm in which we, uh, we do not have style shifting occurring in our data. We suppose that we have just one environment, but at the uh, testing time, we want to see anomalies. We want to detect them from our supposedly known normal data that we uh, saw at training time. And lastly, uh, we have the scenario in which both of these changes occur. So we want to be robust on style changes, meaning that at test time, if we have a new environment coming in, we should uh, detect that and uh, ignore it, uh, whilst uh, still managing to detect uh, what we call anomalous data or different from what we saw at training time. Um, so how do we make this thing work? So we employ a two-step learning process. Uh, the first being a pre-training stage where we learn embeddings robust with those style changes uh, using environment aware methods, just like Lisa. And a side note uh, is that currently they cover on the supervised task, which might have implication for the second step, which is anomaly detection using uh, learned embeddings from the first step. So have these two pieces in our uh, pipeline that uh, in the end we shall detect uh, the, anomalies, uh, the anomalies in our data set, which uh, to be more clearly are uh, the last row on the, uh, on the last two columns in our uh, diagram. Uh, do you have any question? Was I clear with this setup? Um, so we do have uh, on the training time, a selection of classes and environment, which we uh, purposely pick. Uh, and we try to test uh, on uh, images that present uh, classes that do not appear in our training set over with uh, environments that also do not appear in our data set. So we wanted to pick uh, the last two pictures from the last row uh, so now it's because we have like a chimpanzee and squirrel and the same time we saw just monkeys and deers and also the background changes. Um, that's what I was going to say on this slide actually. Uh, yeah, so training occurs on this in distribution data set that we uh, handle it big. Uh, and we preach, uh, and in the pertaining stage, we test on uh, data that shifts only on the style axis. So we tested on only the first two rows on the uh, on the third and the fourth column. So we keep the animals the same; they are the same as the training time, but we change their environment, their backgrounds. And in the anomaly uh, on the last stage, in anomaly detection, we inject anomalies, so other animals. And we want to see if our model differentiates between those and the other so a training, a training time given different environments. So we employ, we adapt uh, already existing MWL methods for supervised learning by building a supervised uh, pretext tasks of binary classification on two plus of the labels. Um, so if you, if you followed uh, closely, you could see that there's a, um, a flow in our uh, thinking where the first step is somewhat uh, supervised uh, and the second of anomaly detection is unsupervised by default. So we want to overcome this need of supervision and we uh, propose a simple method of contrastive learning uh, to in pre-training to mitigate uh, this uh, flow. So a quick recap on unsupervised learning. Uh, in unsupervised learning, we want to class the data uh, by similarity uh, in a unsupervised fashion. So if we have a sample, we want to pick positive pairs, which want to uh, minimize the last loss function on them, and also pick some negative pairs, which we want to maximize the same last function. Um, we usually do that by picking to uh, random augmentation from an anchor sample and try to close up the gap between those. Um, so that's kind of the flow. 
uh, in unsupervised contrastive learning. So what we, we change, we change uh, the quantitative pair selection. So we do get, we do uh, augment a first version of our anchor sample at, uh, but for the second augmentation, we actually select another sample from our data set. So how do you do that? We pick a random different environment from our data set, different to our anchor sample. So if, if on our sample we have the dog on the grass, we can pick uh, either a beach, snow, or indoor environment in which our dog class lies in, or any other class in the data set, so for that matter. And for from the, that pile of samples from an environment, we want to pick the closest one to the anchor. And we do that by uh, training an outer encoder on all the data set and uh, uh, pick the image with the closest uh, to the anchor by an equivalence distance on the embeddings generated by that outer encoder. And perhaps the most boring part of the presentation are the results in which we train different kinds of anomaly detection methods which are probabilistics, uh, ensemble based, uh, and so more. Um, and we can see on, in this graph of the means of those. Uh, no uh, learning approach, mm -hmm. I am. Uh, um, and we can see a bump in uh, performance uh, as well as on our method, which is still an uh, environment aware, um, which increased slightly over uh, this IRMS which are uh, supervised in the pre training step. So we managed to build a fully unsupervised method, which uh, beats every other baseline considered. Uh, so to conclude, we made a formalization of anomaly detection task in style distribution shift scenario, which has not been addressed uh, so far in literature. Uh, we, have, we also empirically proved that uh, environment information does help and you can uh, use it to be robust to anomaly uh, detection performance. And we employ new environment learning, which improves over basic base uh, over item baseline by quite a few percent. Just, uh, so as we just getting started with this topic, and uh, we just introduced that uh, this scenario anomaly detection in the distributional uh, in, in the distribution shift uh, scenario, we. Uh, we like to build uh, and the whole community to build proper data set for the anomaly detection, detection on distribution of shifted data, which we consider very importantly for future developing uh, methods, which come in second in our uh, future work uh, tracing of uh, priorities to develop better methods to detect anomaly using environment information. Uh, so that's going to wrap it. Uh, if you have, do have any questions, I think we're done. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I felt a bit, I didn't uh, really emphasize it, but those uh, methods here, the environment where until uh, the Mocos ones are uh, supervised in pre training. So we still need access to the labels to actually learn uh, uh, our model. In from this on, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we do not uh, know before and which are anomalies and which are which are not. We need some kind of separation between data to uh, 
use those uh, supervised methods to build uh, relevant uh, embeddings. Yeah, so I think that's a, a clearly uh, example. So uh, we do have three uh, classes of animals. The first one being the monkey. I don't know how clearly do you uh, see it uh, from there. Uh, the second is some kind of deer and a third class, which we uh, call it uh, the anomaly, uh, is presented by a chimpanzee in a square. Uh, so we want to detect those as anomaly, but training on only the first few. Uh, yeah, I think. Okay, so we training on the classes. Yeah. The project class to match the boy to train the classes. Yeah, so uh, we do not have, in our training time, we do not know what, anomalous, uh, what an anomaly can be. Uh, we just uh, somehow separate our training data, so it makes sense for our uh, supervised methods to learn uh, relevant values. Right? So in this uh, scenario, we chose those two classes, not knowing what the third class would be, uh, another animal or such. I have a question. Uh, so you yeah. Uh, can you repeat that? <laughs> um, not quite. Um, I actually think I've misunderstood your question. So you can. Yeah. Oh. Set up. Uh, I didn't hear it. Really. Uh, yeah, so we built a positive pair. So a positive pair has two samples in it. Uh, the first one being the classical random magnetization version of the uh, anchor sample. Uh, and the second, it comes from the other samples in our data set, uh, besides the anchor uh, sample. And we select at random an environment different from the anchor, where we take the closest image uh, to the anchor. Uh, yeah. The is also different. So it's not the same forms, and we just change the. Yeah, they are totally different. Uh, actually, they can be at, uh, different animals or different supposed classes that we uh, identify as close to one another. So you do pre-train, right? Uh, no, I, so, uh, yeah, so we do pre-train on these methods here on the uh, downside of the presentation and uh, use uh, anomaly detection methods, which are on the right. Uh, and here is the mean of the results on the right. So we, use, we, we employ different uh, anomaly detection methods like ESO forest, uh, PCA, uh, over the value generated by this pre training uh, step using uh, this algorithm. Those on the right are unsupervised, all of them. And they take uh, the input just the being generated by this algorithm on the samples. So that's kind of the pre-training step, 
we generate embeddings uh, supervised, but on different tasks than the normal versus subnormal there. Uh, either unsupervised, and on those learned embeddings, we uh, separate uh, between normal and abnormal data using uh, anomaly detection methods. And at this step, we inject the anomalies. Here, we do not have notion of what an anomaly can be. So, what's the point of this graph? So you say the environment is aware, right? Yeah. If I go up to follow, I reach a point where there's no line, right? Yes. And, and, and um, does that have to be the method or is it just. So the means are, uh, it's the mean of the skirt on the right. So yeah, if I go up from Lisa, yeah. I reach the 70 mean rock. Yeah, so that's the mean of this. Uh, basically, that's it. And that's the result of it. was how do we uh, make sure that our environments are different and how we can uh, clusterize them. Um, and, the answer, and the answer is that we want to have access to this exact information from our data set. <laughs> is, uh, so we want to have data that uh, we have information on this exact uh, uh, So as an analogy, if we have uh, in medical data, and we want to, uh, I don't know, identify tumors in those, and we, we get uh, data from different uh, hospitals or places. We actually know from which place which sample was took. We just don't know if that there's a tumor or not. So we can have uh, pretty surely accessible, accessible. Uh, so or this information is quite accessible to us in this scenario. Maybe many others. Yeah, so the data that was labeled with a classical label, let's say the dog, and with the environment. So each sample has the label uh, information and also the environment. Yeah, uh yeah and that's what we thought about doing on uh, this uh a selection of positive pairs where we took the same image, we artificially uh, change the background, and we take that as our positive sample, which should be, which should have more clean features of the label there. If that's so.
for those of whom we are going to end here if there are no further questions. Uh, thank you again.